Thank you very much. And I think, as we've heard today, the war in Ukraine marks a devastating shift across the worlds of society, geopolitics, and business. Yet the war is only the latest in the increasingly increasing number of unexpected disruptions impacting the global economy. And it definitely won't be the last. I mean, we've seen greater geopolitical conflict and tensions, greater political intervention in business, and an ongoing climate emergency. And these exogenous risks are CEOs' top concerns today. I guess the risks CEOs can better control, be it the cost of talent, conflicting stakeholders' demands, probably come further down the priority list given the current times. These disruptions are intensified because they have emerged against a particularly sensitive backdrop, featuring the highest inflation levels experienced in over two decades, along with elevated energy prices, strained supply chains, and volatile, supply, volatile financial markets. Apart from that, we're seeing central banks already on a steep trajectory of setting higher interest rates before the war in Ukraine, and these rates are now expected to increase further. So I guess a lot of interesting things in terms of where we're coming from, difficult and challenging times. So maybe I guess my first question to Luca, I mean, Luca, you've got over three decades of experience of advising boards, CEOs, uh, in times of crisis in the past. I guess difficult times to think things through. How do you go about advising companies on setting corporate strategy in the current times? And I guess what's different in today's world compared to what we're used to? Uh, it's different. <laughs> the, um, uh, let me say, we are in an environment of uh, push cost inflation, right? And if we think about the last time when we had push cost inflation, we need to go basically to uh, 91, right? During the, the, the Gulf War. Which means that uh, uh, many generations of CEOs, business owners, entrepreneurs, small business, they don't compete in a push cost environment. Right? So, in, in a way, it's a bit back to basics. So, what, 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 what happens? What happens? Well, typically, consumers have less money to spend, right? And uh, if they have less money to spend, they won't change their behavior. They will find cheaper alternatives. So, basically, we are going to see and witness volatility of market share. And that's absolutely a fact. When you see this kind of environment, that's what happens. Volatility of market share. Customers will switch brand. Customers will go to cheaper products, right? Uh, in all sectors, by the way, every single sector. So, raise of aggregators. By the way, now the world is digital. It's easy to compare prices, to choose cheaper options, right? Way easier. And, um, you know, that is going to create this volatility of market share. Now, how to compete and what to do? Well, um, there is not a big recipe for that, but you know, there are some hints. So the first one is, for sure, you know, transforming your company into Zara, right? I, I put a name, Zara. Zara is famous for being agile, simple, uh, cheap when it needed, multi-brand, multi, let me say, segment. So really kind of uh, being fast uh, in capturing these kind of opportunities. Um, secondly, is mastering the pricing strategy. Because, you know, in the consumer world, for sure, you know, the low-end kind of segments will be price sensitive, but the upper end is actually not as well, right? So there will be much more opportunities there, actually, to, to create fault margins. So all in all, uh, customer-centric strategies to actually tailor all different segments. Very simple, yes, but it's sometimes difficult. And Zara, to me, is a great example to look at because they're really fast. And I think that's a big recipe here. And then, final, then I pass the, the word to, to other colleagues. I think in the corporate world, inflation reduces the value of companies. That's a fact. And uh, companies who have financial muscle and a vision actually can find opportunities to acquire and to grow. So in this particular moment, actually, we see, let me say, the courage you know, of entrepreneurs to actually grow, introduce new markets, actually strengthen the company, strengthen the supply chain, and becoming bigger and more profitable. Thank you, Luke, and I think interesting insights, and, and maybe, I guess, building on that, maybe a question to Melo next. I mean, Melo, you, you operate businesses, I guess, across a diverse range of sectors, diverse range of geographies, and as Marek pointed out, I guess, he said a pessimist is somebody who doesn't know how to take advantage of opportunities. 
I mean, in your view, I mean, given the current times and current challenges, do, does this require companies like yours, groups like yours, which I guess have always been on a big growth trajectory in recent years, to change your investment strategy or to reconsider it? And what are your perspectives around how things might change looking ahead? Well, the, way, the way I look at it is that, you know, you, as long as the business model that you have is, is one which is, which is simple, which, as, as Luca said, yes, you always have to look at cost, at the pricing and things like this. I mean, but this I'd like to think you, can, you should always be doing as a matter of course. I think, you know, uh, you know, you, the formula doesn't really change in my view. What does change is that the mix between, uh, yeah, sorry about that. The mix between uh, what you do in terms of, uh, of cash generating business, of assets that you have, and of cash holding, I think the, the, the shift there changes. Especially because, as, as you know, I was going to say what Luca said, that this creates opportunity. So, you know, you're in, 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 in areas where, um, yes, there's competition, but some of the competition starts to drop out. <laughs> and, and then you have to fight for that, for that space after that. And whoever manages to win that space is, is there to, to win in the future. That's, that's my take on it. And I mean, Natalie, I mean, you've recently been appointed chairperson, so I guess very much in your remit, and I guess building on what Melo said, do you see more opportunity, I guess, in the, in the current times to invest in current businesses, to kind of, I guess, optimize those businesses to drive growth organically? Or do you see more opportunities in M&A, or a bit of both, and I guess being a little bit op opportunistic, building on, I guess, what Luca and Melo mentioned about, I guess, being, you know, having your finger on the pulse <coughs> and identifying those opportunities when the time is right? Um, I think we are at the right time to seek out opportunities. Obviously, as we've been hearing and everybody knows it, we are in a time of crisis. But time of crisis is also a, a time to look at the opportunity for change. So it is all dependent up to us whether we want to, to be bitter during this point in time. Tough times can make you bitter or they can make you better. So I believe that it is in our DNA to seek opportunities where we can become better. And in a world of uncertainties, there is also some certainties that we as, as a group, and I also believe we as a nation, there are some certainties that we need to continue to build on. Our value-driven decision-making and our agility of the decision-making. So amidst of it all, I think part of our strategy is to continue to sustain all that we believe in, that is an inclusive society, a sustainable society. I don't think that is a choice anymore to have sustainable decisions. If our previous generations thought that green is like a philanthropic activity or a choice, I think looking at our future is not a choice. So, although if we had to rebuild our past, I think it would be very hard. We are here to build our future. So, in this remit of things, maybe the negatives that we see coming towards us can be the energy that will take us to where we want to be. Because it's very clear where we want to be as a company, as a group, as a nation. And it's also very clear where we don't want to be. So, I think we can have lessons learned and how much value we give to the value of things, the value of sustainability, and also the value of money. Thank you. And I guess, you know, we mentioned, I guess, you know, you touched upon maybe a couple of the negatives. I mean, Falco, you know, EY Parthenon's global restructuring leader, I think of, you know, a number of decades of experience of driving performance improvement, both in terms of some positive situations, but also, I guess, you know, stepping in as chief restructuring officer, chief transformation officer, when things have gone sour for companies. I mean, what are some, I guess, you know, we've got various mix of businesses in the room, some might be suffering some challenges at the moment. When, I guess, operational pressures start to take hold, what are some tips and advice you'd start to give, I guess, members of the audience, some of the things that you'd start thinking through? Quite operationally, um, timing is of essence, of course. Don't wait too long. 
uh, act early uh, when you see the first signs of performance erosion and uh, think about adaptations. Um, taking people along is key. You cannot restructure, at least not successfully and sustainably, um, without taking people along. Um, that is very important. And, um, and also what I would recommend, certainly um, uh, in the context that we are currently working in, is a larger definition of success. Um, don't look at short-term KPI, look at long-term value. Uh, and don't only look at financial aspects, look at societal and social and uh, environmental aspects as well. So deploy a larger definition of success. And, um, and uh, maybe a last remark, a bit more paradigmatic. Um, maybe we also, in the context of the, 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 the stacked crisis or the poly crisis or the multi-disruption that we're currently experiencing, we need to abandon this idea of ordinary course of business crisis, ordinary course of business, this linear idea of, of phases. And we need to embrace the fact that we are in a period of relatively constant adaptation um, to various sources of uh, disruption. Um, and uh, that is probably easier if we also embrace the creative um, uh, aspect of crisis. Because in a way, crisis is the other side of the transformational coin. It's just human nature. Um, and um, so it has a constructive and creative uh, power to it. Interesting. And I guess, Kenneth, I mean, you've just been appointed CEO of Malta's largest bank. And I guess building on what Falco has just said over here, especially on this, I guess, need to build a, a wider and more holistic and longer term strategy. I mean, how does that kind of play with just coming in, you know, as CEO at a current time when I guess so much is changing, especially for banks when setting strategy, you know, moving from a negative interest rate to a positive interest rate environment and all the opportunities, I guess, but also challenges that that brings through with it. Do you see this opportunity to build something, I guess, more holistic and longer term as something beneficial or is it something more challenging? Interested to hear what you have to say. Look, my view on time-defined strategic plans is that they're not binary in nature. So you don't switch on a strategic plan on day zero, and at the end of year three or year five or year seven, you switch it off. Strategic plans in their very nature are time periods which contribute to the overall, to the overall improvement journey of an organization, firmly anchored to achieve the vision and mission of that organization. I distinctly remember in my earlier days running the subsidiaries of the bank when strategic plans were simple in nature. You know, looking at customers, looking at channels, looking at products, and then applying human resources, you know, financial resources and IT to supply the needs and wants of, of customers. However, today there are a number of external factors that have really significantly changed that dimension. Um, we just look at the changing needs and wants of customers that want to be serviced through different channels. We look at what we call the regulatory tsunami, which has changed completely the governance model of organizations with a significant focus on risk management. Uh, we're seeing the entry of non-banking financial institutions in traditional banking domains. If you look at acquiring business, if you look at lending business, um, you're seeing technology companies, what I call tech fins. I believe we're the fintechs of this world because we are financial services organizations trying to apply technology to service our customers. Whilst now we're seeing these tech fins, technology companies, that are really understanding that there's a gap and the service expectations of customers and using technology to address that gap and then entering their non-traditional traditional domains. So these are, these are impacts and external factors which have an impact on the way that you mold your strategic plan. I mean, in my view, there are, if I take a bird's eye view of our organization, but I think it applies in the same manner to all organizations, I think there are four key quadrants which should underpin the focus of a strategic plan. 
I believe that people reside at the very center. Um, the mantra of companies was very much, you know, customer first. I'm seeing that change in when you look at other companies that the focus is very much on an employee first approach. Because if you have good employees, you have good succession planning, you've got good talent management, good career progression plans, that will translate into operational optimization and it will translate into a better customer service delivery. <coughs> so I think people reside at the very center of these four quadrants. Then there are three other quadrants which are increasingly important. Clearly the customer and the client, and really understanding the needs and wants of customers, not through a top-down approach, but really assessing the pulse of your customers and their preferences and ensuring that you match your value proposition to those expectations. So that's the business quadrant of the, of, of, of the bank. Then there's the operational quadrant. Clearly you need a joined-up organization you know, ensuring that front office and back office, particularly in large organizations, which is a big challenge, are completely joined up. You know, with the onset of what I call um, basement to boardroom units, right? And I'm referring to compliance and risk management functions that are critically important for an, an organization. I, I, I deem them to be the fast brakes of, 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 of a the, the brakes of a fast car, and what I deem them to be as enablers of business. Some see risks as being risk management being on the other side of the fence. In essence, I feel risk management really enables businesses to grow. So, digitizing the operational model and joining up an organization is critically important in service uh, delivery. So, that's the third quadrant of importance. And the last quadrant is clearly governance. And there's a lot of focus, and we've seen the uh, regulatory intensity over these past years uh, when it comes to you know, consumer protection, when it comes to resolution um, and, and bail-inability of banks. You know, a number of areas which have really put a lot of pressure on banks to ensure that they have you know, capital adequacy programs in place. So I think these are the four quadrants which are of importance. And then there are two transversal strategic trusts, and that's digital and data. How you use digital to improve customer experience and the service delivery, how you use digital to operationalize your operational model and digitize that to induce operational efficiency, and increasingly so, big data. I think banks today are realizing how much data they have on their customers, which is not being utilized to identify the needs and wants and preempt the needs and wants of customers. Last but not least, I feel that a new renewed focus is on ESG. We have been talking a lot about ESG and the role that it plays. Today, it has become a regulatory priority. So the way you embed ESG within your organization, I just give an example, um, say looking at the treasury portfolio, right? But really focusing your investments and diluting your exposure to the oil and gas sector, and renewing focus on green bonds and green instruments and companies coming to the market and investing in their equity. The ability to provide a, a product catalog, which is eco-driven eco to the market, and equally using price discrimination when it comes to credit financing. And this is a reality that will hit the market going forward. It will become a mandatory regulatory requirement, and I think we are a bit behind the curve in that space, and a lot more needs to be done to ensure that the market is informed in that space. Thanks, Kenneth. I think you touched upon you know, a number of really interesting things and, and fundamental concepts, I think, when setting strategy, you know, um, the importance of the various different aspects within it. I think ESG being a central component in setting strategy today and how that aligns, I guess, our company's vision, values, and also its customers and stakeholder demands. I think apart from that, though, I think there are a number of other factors that come into play. <laughs> I think there's the human element, which is super important. And I mean, Luca, maybe turn to you again. How do you, I guess, kind of in times like this, in times of challenge, coalesce people together? I think what, what are some of the best examples that you've used or seen in terms of doing that? And secondly, maybe to make it a bit more challenging for you, I guess we're also living through very challenging times where, you know, things can look like they're going plain sailing, and the next day things change and go 
completely a different direction due to various external factors around us. Anything you can do to mitigate that risk and I guess keep those people that you've hopefully motivated um, on the same course and uh, align to sort of the vision direction that you want to go. Right. That's a tough one, eh? and uh, I will not pay the beer after. <laughs> the, <laughs> no, on the, on, on, the, on the people side, I think the, uh, I, I, I don't know, probably it, it looks cheesy, but I truly believe it. And uh, if you look global organization, value-based, right? People, uh, let me say, self-propelled in believing and uh, behaving according to the values of the company, right? And uh, I think uh, we, um, it was said before, no? it was incredible how the European Union helped Ukraine. No? And uh, the notion, the, the value of Europe is basically helping each other. And the government did it, big scale. No? So in the micro, in a company, it's the same thing, right? So um, co companies with great values, stated values, and all, let me say, internal mechanisms and uh, internal systems underpinning those values, right? Because underpinning means they have to be aligned. If you say we believe in whatever, all different systems, KPI, the way you promote people, the way you communicate, the way you actually say, bravo, well done, you know, has to be coherent. And when there is not this coherence, that creates frustration. Right, so people are at the coffee machine, they start chit-chatting, ah, uh, you know, HR <laughs> doesn't work and blah, 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 blah. So the point is coherence, values and coherence. Well, that creates, uh, you know, the, the force that people, you know, when they go to, at work, right, they are self-propelled. They don't need someone telling, do that and that and that and that. I think that's, that's the thing. And also, in a way, helps out to navigate difficult times, right? Because that is, again, is a great strength that, uh, in a way, gives people the motivation, right? And eventually, people motivated, well, it is bloody obvious, but let's state it, people motivated serve customers better. Absolutely, because you transmit that. You transmit an enthusiasm, and a customer wants to see a smile, right? So in all sectors, you know, from services, you know, to groceries, mm -hmm. to, let me say, restaurants, everything, people motivated are happier, work happier, and the customer service is better. And I think that's a true source of competitive advantage. Now, the second part of the question is how to, <laughs> not to derail, right? <laughs> And again, there is not a gold recipe. I think I stress again the coherence. All different messaging, the internal narrative, the formal mechanisms, the controls, the internal audit for big organization, you know, the, the all different components more, let me say, should point to that North Star. More aligned, better companies, and less frustration you see, right? And, and by the way, there is also the, com I mean, not only the engagement of people, the service and whatever, but uh, also the, there is the attractiveness of a company. We have seen all numbers there clearly say that, uh, you know, attracting people and attracting talent mm -hmm. is not easy, particularly here in, Ma in Malta, right? So having the best people ensures better performance. So again, becoming an attractive <laughs> sort of a magnet Right, for talent, I think is absolutely crucial. Thanks, Luke. And I guess, you know, obviously you've spent your life being a consultant and obviously have a senior <laughs> role within consultancies, running businesses. <laughs> but maybe going to the other side and, and to you, Melo, I guess, you know, when things start to go wrong, how do you, I guess, avoid sometimes overreacting, especially when you might know, not know the exact reason something's happening or something might happen in your business. How do you manage to keep control and I guess sometimes avoid overreacting or taking a, a hasty decision where sometimes you just step back? Well, first thing you do is you don't blame somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think what you do in, in situations like that is that uh, you know, you analyze what the, what the situation actually is, and you and you fix. Uh, you have good people around you. I think you don't build strategies and 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 teams when there's a crisis. You know, you. I, I think the results of of what you have, uh, you know, basically what you would have built and the bold decisions you would have made earlier. So my point of view is, we try to not focus so much on on predicting stuff because. You know, it's not really our, our 
plenty of consultants to tell you that. Um, what we do is we invest time in looking at consequences because that's what we're good at. You know, when the, a consequence is something that, that we know. We know that if this happens, you got to do that. So we invest time and money in, in, in that. And then you have to act quickly so that the decisions you make at the time are, are the right ones for, for your people. And to touch upon a little bit about, uh, about people, it's the people that really make, make it happen. Um, maybe our, our organization is, you know, not unique, but, you know, we, we rely heavily on people. We, you know, it's a very, very labor people intensive business that we, we have. So, so it's really key, you know, both in terms of the people you employ and, and the customers and the, you know, anything revolves around the people. We always say that we have plenty of ideas, money in some shape or form you can get. But if you don't have the right people, then you, you don't have an organization, whether it's a good time or, or a bad time that you're in. Obviously, when, when the situation is, is more difficult, then you, know, you, then you really realize how good you are and how good the people around you are. Thanks. I guess people's obviously one part of change. I think you know, one part of you know, obviously what, what really drives success. I think, as we've touched upon before, and as Kenneth was touching upon, I guess, sort of, you know, the whole digitalization agenda is also high on the agenda. I guess a lot of companies probably have a quantum at the moment where they're going to have margin squeeze due to, you know, a lot of cost increases coming in, a potential inability to pass on at least the full extent of those costs onwards to their customers, or maybe not at all. <clears throat> I mean, Natalie, in your view, at times like this, should companies pause, I guess, investments in big change projects that they might be undertaking? Or is it actually a time to accelerate them to really kind of drive through, I guess, the optimization of the business? This is surely a time of transformation. And the acceleration can only happen if we concentrate on the two ingredients for growth, which is the human capacity, it's, we call it human capital, I like to say it's human capacity because it's what we see in the human, in the human side of things and the transformation in our digital world. I think the winners of the future are, will be the people who will be investing in these two great assets right now. So just as much as these would be the things that you want to cut off your list when you're looking at your profit and loss, on the other hand, I think our vision for the future, those have to be the things that we need to secure and we need to continue to inject because ultimately it's not about, the future is not about shareholders' value, it's about stakeholders' value. And I like to conclude with the holistic expression of success. And in these challenging times, I think the, the easiest way to take our decisions is to, to look at success from a holistic point of view, not to forget what we are leaving behind, and to have belief in, in the people and also in the transformation of our societies as we go through this high inflation and high challenging times. Thanks, Natalie. And I guess conscious of time, so maybe a question to both Falco and Kenneth. If you had to pick three top things to make transformation successful, what would they be? Honesty, and that, is, that goes beyond transparency. Yeah. Yeah. Honesty, um, communication, uh, which goes beyond information, um, and, um, and pivoting from management to leadership, because in these periods you need to provide direction. Um, optimizing the deployment of resources is not enough. Thanks, Michael. Kenneth, maybe over to you. I think it's all about inspiring the end vision, you know, within your executive team and their team members. I think that's critically important that they need to understand the end state and they need to see the end state and the, reali the realization of that end state. I think that's very important. Sometimes that's missing. Simply we say we have a digital strategy and you're implementing that. If you don't have strong comms supporting that and a strong change management program around that, because digitalization brings changes to roles and job descriptions. That's a reality. And that sometimes breeds uncertainty. So you need to ensure that they envision the end state. You need to, in parallel, run a retraining and reskilling program because you will need to re redeploy certain employees in certain units to perform other tasks, and that will be part of their career progression. 
So as you said, it's, a mul it's driven by multiple factors, but I think envisioning the end state, comms and reskilling are three important tracks that one should keep in mind. Thank you very much, and I think thank you very much to all my distinguished panelists over here. Um, yep. We now move on to, I believe, the breakout sessions, but Keith, over to you. Mm.